Thank you for being here. My name is Joe Francica. I'm with uh, Pitney Bowes Corporation. You can find us at booth uh, 631. And we'll talk a little bit about today about how to become location intelligent. Um, the first thing we should talk about is what it says in your program that you should learn here today, and that is that we'll look at some complex data connections, sophisticated analysis, and visualization, and I intend to fulfill that promise to you. So as I was looking at what we should talk about here today, first of all, this is a data conference. It's all about analytics. And in particular, this session is going to talk about location-based data and analytics. So with that in mind, this is what we'll start with. Now, for some of you who are into location analytics, this will become quite familiar. And for those of you brave enough to admit that you were majoring in geology in college, please raise your hand. Or sorry, geography, ma majored in geography. Anybody major in geography? You don't count. Well, that's too bad, because there was chocolate involved. If you were a classically chain, trained geographer and studied geography in college, this equation would look immediately familiar to you. And it also exemplifies exactly what I'm going to talk about here today. Now, I am not a uh, classically trained geographer, because when I was looking for a major in college, I went into the geography section of the library, picked up a book, saw these types of equations, and decided to major in geology. This is um, a very easy equation, actually. And if you're into analytics, you should be employing this type of spatial model. It is a spatial interaction model to be exact. And again, if you were trained in geography, it is called the Huff model, designed by Dr. David Huff back in 1962. And some of you, because this session is designated as more about retail, this is a retail model. Now, it looks like a complex algebraic expression. It certainly gives you something to talk about during the break, about how you hated algebra as your subject in high school. It may also help to fulfill the promise that if you came from long distances, this will help your insomnia. You actually employ this model every day if you visit a retail outlet. So let me explain why. Just let's say you're going to a gas station. What is the way you choose to go to a gas station? More than likely, it has to do with convenience, the shortest distance to that gas station. Sometimes it's price, but the D in this equation is distance. And the P is the probability that you will visit any particular retail outlet at any given time. Now, it changes if you're going to a Lowe's or a Home Depot, a Target or a Walmart, because things change. So I don't want to necessarily concentrate just on distance because that's a location-based piece of information. It is actually A, and it has everything to do with data and how you employ data in either a retail setting or otherwise. Because A here talks about all the other stuff that you would want to do when choosing a retail outlet. And those are called attractiveness features. So what Huff proposed was that, yeah, distance is cool, but really what you're doing is you're looking at every other piece of data that gives you the probability that you will visit this particular retail outlet. So let's look at some of those. This has to do with all those other things. Some of them are geospatial, and some of them are not geospatial, OK? There's BOPIS, right? You're familiar with BOPIS? Raise your hand. Buy online, pick up in store. It's huge. It is actually the crossover between battling that dreaded, I'm losing my brick and mortar establishment with your online presence, right? It's, it's huge. 78% people using BOPIS last year's Black Friday season. Parking. Sometimes you'll go to the place where there's more parking. Sometimes you'll go where there's more merchandise. Store keeping units. I'm going to go to this place because they store more 
snow shovels, then the store down the street, okay? I like peanut butter because it's skippy here, but it's the store brand elsewhere. It could be things like uh, external lighting, security. You want to go where there's more security. There could be things like um, the ingress, the egress, the traffic. That's a location feature. You want to have accurate traffic data. How many vehicles pass by this place between 5 and 7 p.m. on a Wednesday? We'll get to more of that later. They have an online presence. They have a loyalty app. That's important. All of those things are critical in deciding where you're going to be. They have a better loyalty program. They do regular discounting. They do demographic targeting. Again, a geographic feature. For example, have you ever been in a Kroger or a Walmart, or a Kroger in particular does this, where they have discounting to senior citizens, 65 years and older? If you ever tried to go down the aisle on Tuesday afternoon, you'll see something like this. Store cleanliness, friendly associates, all of these things are attractiveness features that are relevant to doing a retail site selection model. The convergence of business intelligence and big data has led to data-driven organizations, but they typically miss one thing, and that is what we're here to talk about today, and that is the location element. What if you could more accurately and completely answer the where questions? We ask where questions every single day. Where do I put my new store? Where do I drive my trucks? Where is it that I'm going to find my best customers? Where do I drop a mobile promotion in this particular area at this time? That is a where question, and you ought to be asking those where questions because those are competitive differentiators. Those are the where questions we seek. Why in the world does this happen? Why would a competitor locate exactly next to another competitor? Yeah, but you see this in other things. It's not just McDonald's and Burger King. Where else do you see it? Walgreens and CVS, right? Lowe's and Home Depot. Ford next to Chrysler or BMW or wherever. It happens every single time. Look also at what else is going on in this picture. What do you see? People walking by. Part of this presentation, we're going to talk about mobile trace data and foot traffic. The time of day these people pass by. That's important. Now, here's where chocolate is involved. Where is this place? Little sidebar. You've all got phones. I'm going to give you an example. Where was it? What was it? The first chocolate bar goes out. Where in Turkey? What gave it away? Use Google Maps. Where is it? Right, you read the Turkish. But Bogolu An is actually a street in Istanbul, right? So, little geography quiz, but you all have mobile computers, you all have cell phones, could have gone to Google Maps, easily found it. If you're in London, if you're, uh, um, if you, um, if you're a resident of London, you'll often see something like this, NatWest versus HSBC. Often, they are paired together. Let's go back to this just for a second. Take a good look. This is an old photo that I dug up because it portrayed a particular example. If you did find out that this was an Istanbul and you did use Google Maps and you went to Street View, you would see this. What changed? What was it that made both Burger King and McDonald's leave? Was it that there wasn't enough foot traffic? Was it that the merchandise changed? Was it that the habits of people, was it that the demographics of that particular area changed radically? Was the trade area changing such that it either collapsed or expanded where they wanted to relocate? Half the retailers I talk to are, aren't just opening and closing stores. They're remodeling stores. They're saying, what can I do to drive more traffic into this particular area? So these two guys, they just up and left. If you did another street view and you went 180 degrees, you would see that there's a school across the street. Maybe that was the reason. Maybe that demographic did change. 
or maybe it was that there are less foot traffic. I don't know. But something changed. New retailers are taking their place. It is about the data. What changed for them? These, Burger King and McDonald's are huge, right? They're like real estate companies. They just happen to sell burgers. They need to know exactly where their foot traffic is going and what the demographic is that will directly relate to store sales. That's critically important to them. The definition of location intelligence, as I define it, is the ability to, to manage, analyze, and visualize location-based data to give you that competitive advantage. Because what you will miss by not adding all of the different location-based attributes is that competitive advantage. This is my definition. You won't find it in Wiki Wikipedia. About 15 years ago, I started a conference called Location Intelligence, and we had to have some definition for people sitting in the audience. And this is what um, I came up with as a basic definition. So what's so great about maps? Well, the way I look at it is that when you try to understand geographic information, you can look, if I can get this right, you can look at a great viz, and, and I highly think Tableau is doing a wonderful job at viz. You can see that on this chart there is geographic data. But if you look at a map, and sometimes visualizing maps are really critically important, it leads you to ask more where questions. If this was a map of stores and their store sales and the green was high sales and the red was low sales, you want to know why. Why is there a cluster of green in that one area? This is obviously downtown Toronto. Why is that cluster there? Why, why are there poor sales in the red area? What's the store analog? Why should I be able to match the, the, the store sales in my green areas, find better locations for my red areas, or do I ask the question of closing that store, remodeling that store, or just leaving the market entirely? That's where location-based data can lead you in this type of a visualization. What's this a map of? There's chocolate involved. Anybody want to guess? What? No. Nope. What is it? It's Great Britain. Yes, that's great. Uh, well, what is it showing? Another chocolate. Whoa, it goes out. Well, it shows Brexit. Thanks for that. It shows Brexit, but what is it really telling you? There are differences. There were regional differences that happened. Stay versus leave. Why did all of Scotland left? They vote, or sorry, they let, let, wanted to. They wanted to stay, right? London wanted to stay, but all of the outside regional areas wanted to leave. This is telling you a story, okay? And, and again, I'm using a very gross example of country voting records. But if you looked at the distribution of what happened, you could see, you could, you can make some, you know, analysis of why the voting went one way and it did not in another. Another chocolate question. What's happening in Northern Ireland? Why is there that strong demarcation between stay and leave. Any idea? No, nope. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need a reason. I just want to know there's, there's a very simple explanation of the, and it's based on demographics, based on ethnicity, and if I give you the last one, it'll tell, give it away. Who said Catholics versus Protestants? <laughs> Sorry about that. That is exactly what it is. Is that demarcation that was ethnically and religiously different? Again, it's showing a picture of what the data, uh, what the data is telling you. Let's look at the exciting backstory of location intelligence and BI. This is not new stuff, right? Using location-based data in maps and GIS is not new. Happy GIS Day! If there are any GIS geeks out there like me. In 1992, Forbes went about looking deeper into what was going on with 
maps and data, because back in 92, we were barely using Windows, right? I mean, it was uh, an exploration of what commercial entities, not what cities or states were doing, because that's the traditional use of location data. They were able to afford it, the US government, the military, they're always using it. But commercial entities, banks, retailers, insurance companies, were not there yet. This happened to be an article, if you turn the page on this, it also it talks about Arby's and how Arby's was one of the first uh, QSRs, uh, uh, quick service restaurants, to really invest in location-based information. And back then we were delivering data on like a stack of 24, three and a half inch floppies, if you guys remember that. So it was really complex and really expensive, but that's what they were doing. And so they really went into this, but when I was running the conference, I wanted Arby's to come and talk. I wanted General Motors. I wanted Visa and MasterCard. The problem is, I couldn't get anybody to speak. The reason is, location is a competitive advantage that no one wants to tell them what secrets they're using. We at Pitney Bowes have 25 of the top 25 insurance companies in the country using our technology, our data, our geocoding. Because our precision in geocoding tells them whether their policyholders are inside or outside of a flood zone. They do not want to underinsure or overprice their policies, or there's going to be a great deal of churn. And by the way, that model is an example of the Huff model that I showed you earlier in this presentation. And the example is, again, the probability of visualizing or, or visiting any particular store versus another. And as it shows you on the right side, when a competitor moves in, that trade area changes. And people need to know what is the impact of their sales if a competitor moves in. This is only one store. Think of what a McDonald's does. We're talking billions of dollars when they're impacted by different types of competition. So a little bit of history. In 2004, no BI providers provided anything related to maps Location data, it was peripheral to their analysis. It's just a map. Don't really need it. By 2016, every BI vendor had maps represented as a visualization component, including uh, Tableau, and it is an essential element of your analysis. By some estimates, and it's a, it's a swag number, 80% of all data has a location component. Just think about it. Every time you swipe your credit card, every time you open your phone, there is location data being collected. Now, unless you have location services turned off on your phone, yeah, it's great. And there are privacy concerns. In Europe, it's GDPR. California just passed the Consumer Data Protection Act. These are elements of privacy that are being entered into the calculation of what we do with location-based information, and it's something you need to be aware of also. That's really the hype and reality of location intelligence. My good friends at Gartner in 2013 put up the hype cycle of emerging technologies. And they noted things like near field communication, NFC, wearable devices, and augmented reality. They all had location components. Oh, wait a minute. There's location intelligence. Location intelligence had never appeared in any Gartner hype cycle before this at all. And it appears very close to the platform of productivity, thus denying us who have been in the business for 40 years of having it go from the peak of inflated expectations into the trough of disillusionment. I was bummed. But here it is, already recognized by a major market research company as something that you've got to be critically aware of. But why in the world they put it way over there when they had never recognized it before is just an example of how poorly I think of Gartner. In 2016, they put it at the top of the peak of, uh, uh, of inflated expectations in their, emerging, uh, in their BI and analytics hype cycle. This again, a bit of a surprise. Why is it now inflated just three years later? Well, it is a recognition that it is becoming more visible in the analytics community. I don't agree with their analysis, but here it is anyway. And three years after that, specifically they put it on their hype cycle of marketing and advertising. I think also recognizing of what we're seeing today with mobile trace data, 
with dropping ads into mobile, um, into, your, into mobile apps. You're seeing this more and more. It is becoming important. Again, I don't necessarily agree that it's going into the trough of, of uh, disillusionment. There are many companies out there peddling f foot data and mobile, and mobile traffic, and there's more than a few companies that will help you put location data into your app so that you can deliver the ad at the right place at the right time. We ask geospatial questions every single day. You just don't necessarily realize you're asking those questions. The problem is, can you translate that question that is familiar to you, like, how do I get to my local store, and how long is it going to take me? How do you put that into a tool like Tableau? Well, you do need data. And these are the kind of questions you're going to ask yourselves every single day. How do, I, how, how do we know where the competition is and how are they performing? How can we modernize our marketing, our segmentation data? How do I convert prospects to customers? Um, how do we evaluate and reduce risk? All of these are type, typical types of questions that you should be asking. The, the challenge, as I said, is how do I translate that into a query that I can use in either a, a Tableau or what other, other BI tool you may use. That is where spatial thinking comes in. You have to be spatial thinkers. You have to think spatially. Because even though I've just told you you ask these kind of questions every day, you've got to be thinking, how do I put this data into my model? What, what does it look like? Well, again, for example, if you're looking at just that big one in the middle, where do I put my competition? We, our company, have a point of interest database. We work with a number of data providers that show you businesses by SIC code. Okay, we can segment that. We have a global database of POI data. How do I, um, what was that one? Yeah, how, where do we open and close stores? Well, again, if I went back to the Huff model, you're doing some sort of predictive analytics. Okay, you need a model that tells you not only where your next store is, but your network of stores. How do I put 10 stores in an area? You look at retailers today, they're not thinking about putting one store in there. They're going to drop 10 stores in a 25 mile radius, and they need to know what their trade areas are and what their expected sales are per store, and in some cases, per square foot. Footfall traffic, you know, where do, I, where do my customers go for fun and shopping? Footfall traffic is something we have, something that will tell you where people are going. What amusements are they going to? Where are they going inside of malls? That's really important data. One of our differentiators is we don't just tell you where they're going. We're going to add additional attribution, the A factor in that model. The A, the attractiveness. What are the other factors I can add to footfall traffic? Uh, how do I provide information what's ne nearby? Again, POI data with proximity or radius. And I'll show you an example of geofencing, which you may be all be uh, aware of. How do I reduce risk? Um, we have a number of different databases all about that will help you understand contextual marketing. We have risk data sets that tell you about historical floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, fires. That's the kind of data our insurance companies, our, our insurance clients really, really like. This is really all about contextual marketing. In an era of ambient computing. And what's ambient computing? Well, just take your cell phone out. You are carrying very sophisticated computers, okay? And as I alluded to before, we're in an era of ambient geography. We're collecting location-based data from everything, from Facebook, from Twitter, from and Pinterest. I mean, there is so much data out there. Your job is very difficult. You gotta find out what exactly you need to do your analysis correctly. And how much of it do I need? And that, as I think, is where we could help you out. The objective is to engage the customer at the point of need. This is where location comes into play most likely. If I can isolate where that individual is at a particular point of time, on a particular day, that's going to be critically important. Standard demographics that come from the US Census Bureau tell you generally one slice of time. It's not going to give you the same data that you may want over a period of time. 
So just be aware of what you're getting if you get standard census data. Now we sell census data. We also sell very sophisticated uh, demographic data that take into account age, income, uh, retail uh, vitality, consumer expenditures, like how many people are selling, you know, uh, want to buy a TV in this zip code. Okay, it's, it can be that precise. Take this as an example. If you have a loyalty program and this woman steps up to a kiosk looking for a dress, she may log in with her loyalty number, in which case you know her past expenditures, you know where she lives. If you have footfall traffic, you know origin and destination that brought her to this particular store. You know that her preferences are of a particular style of dress. Maybe you want to provide her a promotion for whatever, shoes, other parts, other different types of apparel. You know so much about this data that you want to pinpoint that person with the right promotion at the right time. This is where all that location-based information comes into play, as well as aspatial data like the transaction volume in that store or made by that particular person. You've got to factor in all of that type of information. Let me give you another example of how I want you to think spatially. Check this out. Find me all of the available Class A office space with at least 10,000 square foot within a half a mile of Central and East 10th Streets in Dubuque, Iowa, where there's an average traffic volume of 5,000 vehicles per day between the hours of 5 and 8 p.m. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a geospatial query. But you ask that question every day if you're a retail uh, vice president. I, I want to put a Panera Bread in that 10,000 square feet. I know that I've got to have it in a central business district. I know that there's got to be a certain traffic volume of, of uh, stores, you know? Sometimes imagery helps. There is East 10th and Central uh, Avenue in Dubuque, so you have a nice picture. But you need other attribution. You need more data to answer that question. And this rather complex query is something you've got to factor out. Like, again, if you ask it every day, how do I put that into a model? How do I get my software to answer that particular question? How do you be more location intelligent? Let's look at these organizations. You probably all have used Uber once or twice. Uber does not make a move without location-based data. You expect it. You expect almost everything that you use in terms of an application on your phone should expect a map. And it ought to be up to date. It ought to be real time. I need to have that data. And Uber processes mountains of data of a location-based nature because they, know, they need to know where their drivers are, what routes they're taking, again, origin and destination, what the traffic volume is, is it safe, how do I, how do I uh, insure these drivers? These are the questions you need to ask and it, they are geographic questions. Waze, I, I don't know if I have to explain that, I mean, they have to have up-to-date crowdsourced information about traffic and accidents and whatnot. Cushman Wakefield, the commercial real estate company. CSX. CSX is a railroad company? No. They're a real estate company. UPS. This is Jack Levis. He was one of my keynote speakers. He's the senior director of process management. This next statement blew my mind. This is what he said. We've moved from being a trucking company that uses technology to a technology company that just happens to drive trucks. That's an amazing statement. Actually, it was made this morning in the keynote. I believe it was the woman from Nissan something that said that we've, we about, something about we're moving people. And it's a very similar way to look at their business. They're an inf Nissan said it, right? They're, they said they're an information technology company. But UPS has been doing this for years. They know when they open the door both the, the driver door and the back door. They know when they buckle the seatbelt. They know when they back into a highway. They know how many times they've made that trip. Levis said, if I can save one mile per truck, per day, I save millions of dollars. They reduce their carbon footprint. They save gas. They save insurance money. Just think about that. They're transitioning themselves, and to me, this is an example of digital transformation exemplified. They've done it. They're, and, and there are more and more companies utilizing data in this way. 
Let's talk a little bit about what we do. We have a customer, Domino's, that does an interesting thing with, with retail data. Um, they not only use it for locating stores, and they use our models. Um, we have an entire analytics department that helps retailers do models. They use customer information. They use standard demographics. But they also use it for another interesting type of application. They had franchisees um, that they were battling with because they wanted to drop in more stores. Again, network optimization, right? How do I maximize my, net, my sales potential in a given geographic region with knowing exactly how many stores I got to put in there? But they don't have just company-owned stores. They have franchises. And so in order to convince a franchisee that, hey, we really need another store here, no, that's going to impact my trade area. My trade area is protected. That's legally bound in my contract. You cannot put a new store in there. But they convinced them, using location-based data, that by dropping a new store in, they actually would increase their sales. It's kind of like going back to that attractiveness model before, which is, well, if I see more of you, maybe uh, that's a more of a branding exercise. You all know the retailer All Ball Pan? Yes? Ever heard of it? You ever see them do advertising on TV? Nope. Ever walk down downtown down Boston? You'll hit an all ball pan on every single block. They, just, they will get you one way or the other. It's a great location technology strategy. Uh, mobile marketing, we did discuss about, um, obviously, about uh, foot traffic. Um, we do a lot of analysis, but we also do something called branded geofences. So if, you need, if you're interested in working with a particular organization, a, a retailer, we can give you the boundary of that individual brand. Could be a CVS, could be a Walmart. We'll give you the boundary of the uh, mall or the parcel or the out parcels or the strip mall. We'll give you a boundary of the campus so that you could do a better job of dropping mobile ads and a better job of mobile marketing. In the ad tech space, um, we want to know where people go. And we are working with a couple of, of um, e-commerce companies right now that when you come to their site, you know, it'll basically look at the MAC address. It'll basically a, a, a look at your location and try to estimate maybe, you know, what's the proximity of that I can do outreach to that particular visitor to that website. In the world of mobile trace data, I'll go a little bit into detail, but I don't want you to focus too much on the charts above. I want you to focus on the statement where, again, in standard census demographic information, you're really looking at social profiles and consumer profiles that are of a particular uh, time of day. And the Census Bureau generally is going to give you where they took the census, right? So if you fill out a census form, it's probably going to be sometime at night. But really what you want is something during the day and so the mobile trace data really transforms that demographic profile into something more dynamic. We can give you a slice of time between noon on Tuesday, as an example. That's the benefit of mobile trace. So really, mobile trace data, the, the benefits of is to allow you to examine the movements in time. The top giving you the actual raw data, the bottom doing an origin and destination model, if you need that. And then... Again, what are the significant differences in population characteristics? As I said earlier, we can not only take that raw mobile trace data, but we can add attribution to it that will help you do a better job of analytics. In the telco and utility space, you know that 5G is critically important right now. Most of the, the wireless telcos are looking, where do I put my microcells? That's a location-based problem. It's actually also a problem for local governments because they're looking for a different revenue stream. So if they could present their public assets as a location for where to put microcells, bingo, they've got another revenue. But it does take a little adjustment in, in terms of how they're used to working with commercial entities. But all of the wireless carriers, of which there are only a few, they're all looking at what's the best way to locate my, my um, cells. But to do that, they have to prioritize where they're going to put them. Where are they going to benefit the most subscriber pool? Are they going to put them in a high-density area where the, where the uh, 
the income probability of them get lining up more 5G subscribers is more? Do they need income data? That's the kind of questions that they're asking themselves currently. In the insurance space, I alluded to this earlier, risk data is critically important to their models. Knowing precise addressing is very critical. We happen to have a database of about 190 million addressable addresses, both postal and non-postal. We can tell you if you're in a high-rise building, what the addresses are. In a gated community, you don't want to deliver a package to the mailboxes that are strung out. You want to have a delivery point. We have those delivery points. So high-precision G-code is extremely important in many different industries. Financial services, in particular in crime uh, fr and fraud, we have a lot of information. It's not just about locating banks. It is about some of the risks that the banks are taking. So answering the where questions, where can I find location-based data for Tableau? Um, certainly you can come to very simple URL, pb.com slash SDM, which stands for our Software and Data Marketplace. But also it's, uh, we, we can expose that on the Tableau website. So we have data for a number of different sources and a number of different industries all across many industries, and the data is directly importable into Tableau because Tableau supports our native formats. If you want, um, please visit with me uh, at booth 631. You could tell these women were highly enthralled. They later had to go out and get a double shot espresso after speaking with me. But please come and visit us. We'll be happy to answer any more specific questions. We are sponsors of the Iron Viz, which will be uh, this afternoon at 5.30. The uh, VIZ uh, contestants are using our data, so please um, take, a, take a visit to there. I think it'll be very interesting. And lastly, we're having a hands-on session uh, on uh, Friday. Uh, Colin Madison is here with me. Stand up, Colin. Um, he'll be able to put you hands-on to use our data directly Friday. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention uh, and encourage you to be more location intelligent. Thank you.